we never thought we would be in this position today, 10 years ago. So it's very hard to predict the future. So uh, it could be that you know fracking doesn't deliver nearly what we thought it would. I, my whole thing has always been if you develop an economy based on a depleting resource, it's always a very, very dangerous thing. Um, there are many, many things that can happen. OPEC still controls 42% of the world's oil production. So, um, you know, Saudi Arabia still could bring the entire world to its knees by knocking 4 million barrels a day off the market if they chose to. So it's still a very, very dangerous situation in my view, our dependence on oil and how dependent we are on oil. I used to follow peak oil, the peak oil community really closely and you know everything seems to have changed in the last five years due to hydrofracking. I mean the right. impression that I get from the outside now is it's just a totally different uh, future. What's your general feeling on hydrofracking, not just in the United States but as it spreads to the rest of the world? Well most of the rest of the world doesn't have the same sort of geology that we do. Like China has a lot of resources but they don't have water where they need water. So. Um, and a lot of places don't have the same sort of geology. Like California, it's got the Monterey Shale, but it's so folded and bended that even though there's a tremendous amount of resource there, they don't think they'll ever be able to get much out of there. And a lot of the world is like that. I think that's the biggest thing that was missed in the peak oil debates is that as prices get higher, more marginal pro projects become economical. And I think people underestimated how much oil there was available that could come online as project as the price went up. And I think if oil had stayed at $100, we continue to set new records for another few years before we peak and then start to decline. Now that they are starting to perfect or at least greatly improve the fracking technology, what's your feeling on the dollar level per barrel that they can continue at least 50% of their production uh, they still the $50 they, a barrel. Yeah, I think they need 60. I, I think uh, if you see where they started really slashing capital expenditures, $60 they really started cutting back and I read a lot of uh, the quarterly earnings reports and I think most of them are going to need about 60 bucks. That's, there are some that can make money at lower prices but the average company is not going to make money at uh, at $45 or $50. I think they need 60 and to really, you know, if, if we had a serious demand shortfall, prices are going to go up, that's going to bring on more, they've got a lot that are um, uh, drilled but unfracked. I was just up in North Dakota and there's a lot of those up there where they drilled them and they have to do that because of the lease. They have to have some activity so they go and drill it and then they cap it and they're waiting for prices to improve a little bit before they frack it. Is your feeling that there are other oil shale formations that that may be discovered or that they've pretty much all been discovered and we have a general idea of, of what what price they, they can be uh, exploited at? Yeah, I, w I wouldn't say they've been dis all been discovered. Remember, the Eagleford in Texas, the largest oil field in the U.S. right now is in the Eagleford in Texas and it wasn't even discovered until 2008. Do you think that there's much room for additional efficiency improvements in efficiency with hydrofracking that you know maybe it, uh, some of the oil that's costing sixty dollars a barrel to extract now in five or ten years maybe it will only cost forty dollars a barrel or we've pretty much reached the maximum efficiency with hydrofracking I think um, we the, the low-hanging fruit is gone I mean if I looked at a, a curve it would be starting to flatten off now I think um, you know a lot of the oil that's sixty dollars a barrel to produce is sixty dollars because there's just not enough oil in that you know formation um, you know they've done a lot of experimentation with um, you know getting the horizontal drill right in the middle of the formation and just how many stages that they need to put in and just how much sand um, but I think most of the you know they, they figured most of it out I think I think you may see some incremental improvements but not like we've seen over the past couple of years. And if you had to guess for the rest of the world, do you think that the United States is fairly unique in our ability to to uh, extract uh, shale oil, or are there going to be other big regions like the U.S.? Yeah, I don't think there's going to be anything like the U.S. Um, they've tried it in Poland already, and they, they the oil majors gave up, and they said, Geology is not right here. So just because a country has shale deposits doesn't mean um, you know there, there are many many factors that can that can um, you know impact upon their ability to get that oil out. 
So um, there are a couple of places I've looked at. I think Argentina will have a little shale boom, and I think Australia will probably have a little shale boom. Um, China, I don't know. I mean, they got a lot of gas, but uh, uh, you know, they got some challenges there. But uh, Russia will have some. Russia will have a little boom, I think. And in the United States now, let's say oil went back to $100 a barrel uh, and stayed there for five years, and we started exploiting all of the shale oil we could. Do you have the impression that we could you know, even double our production at, at, of shale oil at, at $100 a barrel, or we're pretty much exploiting everything as quickly as we can now? Yeah, no, we're not now, but we were. So we've, over the, until this year, uh, we were adding oil at the fastest rate in U.S. history. In the whole 150-year history of the U.S. oil industry, uh, the past three years before this year was the fastest growth period ever. So there was no sign of slowing down. In fact, it was accelerating. If you look at the curve, we were actually accelerating. So how long would that last? Um, it, it would have gone on for another four or five years probably before we really started to slow down, I think. I think we could have exceeded the peak that we had in 1970. I would have thought there was no way that that would ever happen five years ago, but the speed that we were increasing, there was there was showing no signs and of, of slowing down. And if you look at all the undrilled locations, like the companies that have identified places that they can drill, there's a humongous backlog of those of those locations. You know, if you look at how much biofuels we could actually grow, it's pretty limited relative to the amount of oil we use. I think electricity is a different ballgame. I think you have many, many different ways to displace coal. So I've been very negative on coal for years. Do you see that as, as continuing to, to the point where maybe in 10 years solar will be the, the cheapest form of electricity? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I saw this start to play out in Hawaii. In Hawaii, solar was already cheaper than uh, fossil fuels because we used oil to make our, we use oil to make electricity out there. And what's happened is they've got like 15% solar penetration in some neighborhoods out there, and the utilities are throwing on the brakes because they said it's destabilizing the grid. Now, I've talked to some of the utility offline, and they said, no, it really is. It's causing us uh, hell to try to manage this. Eventually, you know, I think most of our power will come from solar power, eventually. We've got so many rooftops, so much... Uh, unproductive area right now that can be used to collect solar energy at a much, much higher efficiency than photosynthesis that I think it's inevitable. Do you think the efficiencies and the cost of the panels themselves are going to continue to improve or that we're kind of leveling off now in, in what we can gain there? Yeah, I, I, my own feeling is we're probably leveling off. Um, I mean, we've had you know, an order of magnitude drop in costs in the last few years. I don't think that'll happen again, but... Um, uh, I think we'll still see some maybe cost improvements going forward, but I think I think we are going to hit a limit here before long. Typically, the fracked zones are thousands of feet below the the aquifers, but the wells still have to go through the aquifer. So you've got a well that's drilled and it's got cement and it's got pipe that goes through an aquifer. There have been cases where that well casing has leaked and gotten some stuff into the aquifer, but We've had like a million frack jobs in the United States, and we've been fracking in the United States since the since the 50s. So if fracking really was contaminating water, we wouldn't have any clean water anywhere right now. Um, so the, the issue is largely overblown. Um, but like always, I mean, accidents can happen. You are putting fluids in the ground. They are going through the aquifer. They can be spilled. They can leak. But the frack zone itself... Um, there, there are no cases. In fact, um, uh, like I said, there are cases where a, a well has leaked, but the fracked zone, there are no known cases of a fracked zone leaking water into an aquifer because it's just thousands of feet, and those, fracks, those fractures are not that long. They, don't, they can't traverse thousands of feet to get into an aquifer.